Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all here for the final keynote speaker of the week. Um, just a few reminders. Um, am I getting feedback here, Ronan? No, I can get here a little. Um, if you would like to attend the final event um, of the week um, with our closing remarks, um, you need to register um, for that in advance. So it isn't just a case of clicking on the link, you need to go into that in advance um, today and register because it's with the consulate, the Boston consulate, the Irish consulate in, in Boston. Um, so that requires registration. Um, so today we're in the webinar format again, so that means um, that you can't, of course, all see each other, unfortunately, but just to create a sense of community, we'd really encourage you to, um, you know, say hello in the chat, add a question as, as we go along through the, the talk and we can come to a few questions um, at the end. Okay, so we'll get started. So I'm delighted to introduce um, our speaker, uh, today, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, um, Colleen Parsons. Um, Colleen is an associate professor in the Department of English uh, at Georgetown University, where he is director of the Global Irish Studies Initiative. And there he has really positioned Irish studies as an outward looking, globally engaged discipline, promoting connections, shared histories and um, differences. And I think that has been a, a really important aspect of, of the work he has been doing there. His award-winning first book, The Ordnance Survey and Modern Irish Literature, which I have here on my desk, um, was published by Oxford University Press in 2016. And it explores literary modernism in Ireland, focusing on Joyce, J.M. Singh, James Clarence Mangan, Yeats and Beckett. Um, tracing the influence of the Ordnance Survey, which mapped Ireland in the two decades running up to the Great Famine, the book demonstrates the indelible mark of the survey on the very concepts of la landscape and country, which can be found in the Irish writing to follow. Colleen Parsons has published two co-edited collections. Um, they are uh, Relocations, Reading Culture in South Africa, uh, co-edited with Imran Kuvedia uh, and Alexandra Dodd. Science, Technology and Irish Modernism, co-edited with Catherine Conrad and Julie McCormick Wang. Um, and he also co-edited with Agatha Sheshwick Brewer, a special issue of the journal Interventions, International Journal of Postcolonial Studies, and that was called South Africa and Ireland, New Geographies of Comparison. So these publications give us a sense of the breadth of Dr. Parsons' work and research interests from Irish literature, global modernism, space and scale, cartography, post-colonial literature and theory. And he's also interested in archival research in literature and theories and histories of colonial archives. He has a number of new projects underway, including his second monograph project, which is Telescopic Modernism, the Novel and the Planet. This sounds absolutely fascinating, looking at how modernist writers from the Anglophone world engage with the discourse and insight of astronomy in their attempts to figure the planet. He also has an edited volume um, with Cambridge University Press under contract that is on Irish literature in transnational and global perspective. And that's part of the series, um, which has been overseen by Ronan MacDonald on new directions in Irish literary studies. And he's also begun work on a book project, which I think will be of interest to many of us on Joyce and the Global South. So um, we look forward to that. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Colleen, who's speaking to us today with the title of Work of Progress. Thanks, Catherine. Um, uh, and thanks uh, to Laura, Ronan, John McCourt and everybody else who, who has made this um, possible. Um, I, I can't express enough my admiration uh, for the generosity with which you've organized what's definitely the most collegial and the most collaborative virtual conference that I've uh, attended in the last year and a half. I haven't luckily attended any before that. Uh, even like putting the program together across 18 hours a day and over a dozen time zones was, I think, a labor of respect and generosity uh, for the conference attendees. And I know that every one of us appreciates how much work you've done. So a heartfelt thanks uh, from me and from everybody else. Um, it's really been a pleasure to be here. Of course, I'd much rather be, as all of us, much rather be in Trieste. And thanks in particular for, to Lara for the amazing virtual tour of Trieste, which I enjoyed yesterday. It was a 
while it was very good, it was a pale imitation of what it would be like to be there in person with all of you. It's lovely to hear from all of you from around the world and, and enjoying seeing that in the chat. Uh, just a quick note on my setup. Um, I'm in a strange house with a strange computer screen setup. So I'm going to be looking up to the heavens a little bit to read my paper. And since I'm going to be talking about astronomy, I think that's that's pretty fitting. Um, so if I look like I'm casting my own eyes up to heaven as I'm reading my paper, it's not um, it's not because I'm casting aspersions on my work. So I'm going to talk about astronomy and cosmology today, subjects that the longer I spend thinking about them, the less I think I understand them. And in talking about them, I'm going to be leaning a little bit more heavily on the omniscientific than the Joyce part of uh, this year's, um, uh, the title of this year's um, colloquium. So um, just give me one second while I share a screen. That, that should work. Give me a shout, uh, Catherine or Rona, if that's not working. Um, I'm going to be thinking while doing that about a long genealogy of a few fleeting moments in Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, one that illustrates the long afterlife of a moment in 19th century Irish scientific history. Of course, I'm hardly the first to think about astronomy or cosmology and the modernist novel. We can think of the work of Holly Henry on Virginia Woolf. And of course, Catherine Avery. Catherine, I see you're in the audience. Hi, uh, uh, greetings from California. Um, Catherine Avery's careful and detailed readings of Yeats, Joyce, Yeats, Joyce, and Beckett in Modernism and Co Cosmology, which I'll refer to again a couple of times. Both of these works, of course, are in conversation with scholars like Michael Whitworth, Daniel Albright, and more recently, Rachel Crossland, whose work on modernism and physics writ large from the universe to the atom have sketched out an entire field of inquiry. In Joyce studies, of course, there's also Jeffrey Droon's excellent monograph on Joyce relativity and modernist print culture, tracing how and where Joyce learned of developments in relativity and quantum physics. So I need hardly remind an audience that signed up for a symposium on omniscientific Joyce that this is a crowded field into which I'm wading. And I'm deeply indebted to all of these works on astronomy and its sort of adjacent sciences. But while the fertile field of quantum mechanics and the new physics and newer astronomy, uh, to use rather broad brush terms, has been the subject of this work over the last couple of decades, I want to turn for my talk today to an older set of astronomical and cosmological questions that long predate Einstein, the sort of you know, patron saint of modernism and science, and that make their way somewhat stealthily and unevenly into Joyce's work. The debates are about the origin of our and other solar systems and galaxies. I figured I'd take it all on today. Why not? I may as well just go, go big. Uh, and they fall under the general title of the nebular hypothesis. Thought you might like a nice picture of a nebula. Um, where better to begin a discussion of an astronomical or cosmological debate than with some illuminating clarity from Leopold Bloom in the Lestragonians chapter? You'll all know this. Never know anything about it. Waste of time. Gas balls spinning about, crossing each other, passing, same old ding dong always, gas, then solid, then world, then cold, then dead shell, drifting around, frozen rock like a pineapple rock, the moon. Must be a new moon out, she said. I believe there is. Well, maybe we shouldn't start there. Maybe we should turn to that well-known, at least to Joyceans these days, but formerly very well-known popularizer of science, Robert Ball, whose work you'll remember sits on Bloom's shelf and of whom Bloom thinks during the course of the day. Here's how Ball describes the nebular hypothesis. Suppose that countless ages ago, a mighty nebula was slowly rotating and slowly contracting. In the process of contraction, Portions of the condensed matter of the nebula would be left behind. These portions would still revolve around the central mass, and each portion would rotate on its axis in the same direction. As the process of contraction proceeded, it would follow from dynamical principles that the velocity of rotation would increase. And thus, at length, these portions would consolidate into planets, while the central mass would gradually contract to form the sun. By a similar process, on a similar scale, the systems of satellites were evolved from a contracting primary. These satellites would also revolve in the same direction, and thus the characteristic features of the solar system could be accounted for. In rather plainer language, 
we could say that the nebular theory, which in its very broad outlines remains the most accepted model of the formation of the solar system and our planetary systems, suggests that the sun and the planets are formed from a rotating cloud of gas and dust. It's a rather grand, all-encompassing theory about the origin of planetary systems that by the turn of the last century, by the early 20th century, um, already have a long and distinguished history, having been proposed and reproposed and amended across the 19th, 18th and 19th century by Swedenborg, Kant, Laplace, even John Stuart Mill and others. But it was the astronomer William Herschel and his sister Caroline, along with William's son John, who spent the greatest amount of time cataloging and observing nebulae in the 19th century. William was convinced that there was a progression from nebulosity to stars at play in the universe although the progression was so slow that no one human could see it taking place during his or her lifetime. So how then could we observe the nebular phenomenon? Here's Robert Ball again, uh, using an illustration that he draws from Herschel's own work. But it may be asked, how did Herschel know this? How did he know that this sort of progression was taking place, this development was taking place? What was his evidence? Let's answer this question by an illustration. Go into a forest and look at a noble old oak which has weathered the storm for centuries. Have we any doubt that the oak tree was once a young, small plant and that it grew stage by stage until it reached maturity? Yet no one has ever followed an oak, through, through its an oak tree through its various stages. The brief span of human life has not been long enough to do so. The reason why we believe the oak tree to have passed through all these stages is because we're familiar with oak trees of every gradation and size from the seedling up to the noble veteran. Having seen this gradation in vast multitude of trees, we're convinced that each individual passes through all these stages. But I'm not gonna to talk today about the intricacies of the nebular hypothesis. I am no astronomer, uh, far from it. What I want to do is to emphasize that the history of investigations into the nebular hypothesis was never strictly about the formation of stars and planets. Herschel's analogy between an astronomer looking into the skies and a naturalist in a forest is built, you can see, on a historicist premise that we can observe a phenomenon, stars, trees, nations, people, languages, insert what you want here in the 18th and 19th centuries, that we can observe a phenomenon from immaturity to maturity all at once as time is spatialized. You'll notice that the central proposition here is that the solar system is in a constant state of motion from loose nebulosity to fully formed planets and onto the next undefined or invisible stage. In short, our solar system, our galaxy, and countless nebulae in the sky are heavenly indices of a universal law of progress from gas to form, one superseding and improving on the other. As an astronomical theory, the nebular hypothesis was from its very beginning teetering on the brink now a theory of star formation, now a general theory of the universe and of human society. It was an inflection point and a precursor to Darwinian theories of evolution at, which, at a point at which relations between the human and the non-human world were being negotiated. Uh, quite a different point from the, uh, from the sort of negotiation of human non-human that that excellent panel this morning took on in many ways thinking about it in uh, significantly colder, um, uh, more Im immaterial ways. Um, so I want to turn to the work of Simon Schaefer here to summarize the cultural and philosophical importance of what was, on the one hand, an astronomical question, on the other hand, a question of social theory. Whether and how the solar system evolved or was somehow willed into existence went to the very heart of arguments in the early half of the 19th century about evolution, progress, and the existence of a natural law that determines human life on Earth. John Pringle Nickel, a political economist who dabbled in astronomy, um, John Nickel appears to have been lost there, there we are, a, a political economist, economist who dabbled in astronomy precisely to try and find a natural law of progress, declared in 1837 or 1838, that in the vast heavens, as well as among phenomena around us, all things are in a state of change and progress. There too, on the sky in splendid hieroglyphs, the truth is inscribed that the grandest forms of present being are only germs swelling and bursting with a life to come. 
if we could just prove by observation or inference, Nicol thought, that the heavens themselves progressed from nebulous gas and dust to stars, systems, and planets, we'd have the proof of a fundamental and inexorable law of progress here on Earth, giving a natural law boost to the workings of reformers. Among Pringle's most enthusiastic readers, by the way, was um, were George Eliot and uh, G. H. Lewis, and in many ways, the sort of these, this whole work coalesced around the Westminster Review in the 1850s, where you know Eliot and Lewis and Herbert Spencer and John Stuart Mill and others were were involved. In fact, Nichols' uh, friend and collaborator, John Stuart Mill, also saw the need for an overarching theory of progress. The fundamental problem of sociology, he writes, is to find the laws according to which any state of society produces the state which succeeds it and takes its place. This opens the great and vexed question of the progressiveness of man and society, an idea involved in every just conception of social phenomena as the subject of science. And we can think about the way that Mill sort of inserts uh, sort of a, a, a future tense into the very idea of a sociology, something that in many ways we've lost today if we think about the discipline as it exists now, but it was at that time an imagination of the emergence of a future world. The nebular hypothesis with its overarching conception of the gradual and deliberative creation of the solar system provided exactly the kind of rational and science-based foundation for the fantasies of progressivist philosophy like John Stuart Mill's. Nickel uh, was not the first, as we know, to suggest that nebulae were star sites of star and planet formation. But it was Nickel and William Wewell, really interesting character, uh, Wewell, together, who made the nebular hypothesis a cause célèbre in the 1830s and 1840s. Nickel's mesmerizing lectures on the subject appealed to mass audiences. And it was Nickel who brought the logic of the Immanuel Kant, Simon Laplace hypothesis into the severe sphere of human progress, instrumentalizing astronomical conjectures on the origins of the universe. His work was explosive and it had a transformative effect on that most influential of 19th century thinkers, Herbert Spencer. Even as Spencer himself in the 1850s stepped back a little bit from the easy moralizing of Nichols' position and tried to build a wall between scientific re research and immediate human consequences. And this is uh, Spencer and I think my, oh, there we go, yeah. The current conception is of progress, he writes in 1857, the current conception is a teleological one. The phenomena are contemplated solely as bearing on human happiness. Only those changes are held to constitute progress which directly or indirectly tend to heighten human happiness. And they're thought to constitute progress simply because they tend to heighten human happiness. But rightly to understand progress, we must learn the nature of these things considered apart from our interests. Ceasing, for example, to regard the successive geological modifications that have taken place in the earth as modifications that have gradually fitted it for the habitation of man, and as therefore constituting geological progress, we must ascertain the character common to these modifications the law to which they all conform. And similarly, in every other case, leaving out of sight concomitants and beneficial consequences, let's ask what progress is in itself. The sentiment seeks to be admired as an, uh, Herbert Spencer always sought to be admired, but it seeks to be admired as an objective analysis of the entire planetary system. But the answer for Spencer is always to hand. His first principles there, where he set out sort of an entire synthetic system of understanding the world, was a unifying theory. <clears throat> was the his first principle in the book, First Principles, was the nebular hypothesis, an ur form of the social evolution he saw everywhere in the world around him, an irrefutable proof of the validity of his system built on Nichols' work. The, the entire argument of First Principles is structured on the nebular hypothesis. What I want to give you here is a sense of the wide ranging impact in the 19th century of this nebular theory, as it undergirds everything from the liberalism of Mill with its implications for the project of empire, to the reformism of Nickel, to Spencer's theories of so social evolution, to the eugenicist thinking of Galton. And I want to sort of, um, remind us, uh, anyone who heard Greg Winston's excellent paper yesterday on Galton eugenics and, uh, and Joyce, that we could think about there having been, in fact, an astronomical or a cosmological basis 
to the work of Galton. Uh, and Spencer, of course, published um, uh, First Principles and this argument on progress, its law, and its causes um, a couple of years before Darwin's origin of the speech and species. Spencer's name brings us back finally, or brings us there, first of all, finally, to Joyce. We don't need to look very far in Ulysses to see a skeptical engagement with Spencer and the imperatives of progress. On a macro level, let's take, for example, Aeolus from the stalled trams at the end, offset, of course, by hackney cars, cabs, delivery wagons, mail vans, private brooms, aerated mineral water floats with rattling crates of bottles, rattled, rolled, horse-drawn rapidly. So from those stalled trams to Professor McHugh's denunciation of the cloacal obsession to the parable of the plums, the chapter offers us the perfect, the object lesson in the dialectic of progress and paralysis. And McHugh's ill-tempered blinkered arguments, much as they might elicit some sympathy, give us a sense of the Janus face of anti-progressive arguments, which shoot off simultaneously in directions conservative and revolutionary. Joyce was in possession, we know, of a copy of Spencer's Principles of Sociology, though, of course, we're all in possession of books that we have not read. Um, in fact, behind me in this, in this office are a bunch of books on um, self-development, uh, um, which I have not cracked open yet, but Spencer would enjoy them. But Joyce also took a couple of notes from Spencer's facts and comments in his early commonplace book. You probably won't be able to see this, but I'll, I'll read them for you. They're on the right here. Um, this is from his uh, commonplace book, 1903 to 1912. Um, now, this is from Spencer. Now, from a good style are excluded all words having unsettled connotations, save where indefiniteness is intended, which is not in this case, which it is not in this case. He also copied, hereafter her, this is George Eliot, her rank will be considerably higher than now. Incidentally, Luca Crispy points out that this is the page of the manuscript that Joyce showed John Millington Singh in the Hotel Corneille in, uh, in Paris. And Crispy notes after Gorman, the ironic tone of these pages, difficult to think about note-taking as ironic, but indeed this is what it appears to be, Joyce's impatience with weak style apparently expressed in his choice of quotation. These are, I hesitate to use, to use the word throw away, but I'll use it anyway, copyings. But Joyce also had a much longer and less easy to dismiss as ironic engagement with Spencer too. Its critical stance signaled most clearly by the phrase destruction of the fittest that we see in Eumaeus that invents Spencer's most famous coinage, survival of the fittest. Kevin Hart uh, in just last year's James Joyce Quarterly very carefully and convincingly detailed the Spencerian footprints in Eumaeus, which associates Bloom with the methods and preconceptions, he writes, of Victorian urban poverty studies. And I love the insight where he says, like Bloom, the Victorian sociologist was a type of engaged flaneur. Equally, John Gordon points to a portrait and Oxen of the Sun as the locations of Spencer's appearance in Joyce's work. Though Spencer in Gordon's argument appears in a less ironic, ironic cast than Hart argues for in Eumaeus. So I recommend uh, both of these to you, both of these readings of Spencer's traces in Joyce to you. But I don't want to stake my own argument here today on whether Joyce knew or was engaged with Spencer's idea of the nebular hypothesis. What I want to say is that among the ways that Joyce thinks through and with and against ideas of progress is in dialogue with a social theory that appears in drag as cosmology. And while I've so far spoken of this theory as a largely British and continental European phenomenon, there was an Irish branch to the debate over the nebular hypothesis that exposes in quite sharp terms the historical, political, and material conditions under which knowledge is produced, and that offers a glimpse into a robust, though ultimately scientifically pretty misguided, Irish challenge to the primacy of progress in the 19th century. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of the the the, uh, the progress. Well, I can't use that word of the nebular hypothesis in Ireland, um, and this is where we see, in many ways, the the sort of the relationship between astronomical science and other sciences coming together and becoming sort of you know in in indissociable from each other. I introduced Nickel, uh, John Pringle Nickel, as somebody who dabbled in astronomy, and that's true. He was really a political economist. But he also managed to be appointed professor of astronomy at the University of Glasgow and director of the Glasgow Observatory, 
with little or any experience in or capacity for or interest in um, observational or mathematical astronomy. His advocacy of the nebular hypothesis as an in indicator of natural law was strenuously objected to by other astronomers, most notably by John Herschel, the son of, of William Herschel, um, nephew of Caroline Herschel. But I want to look now in this section of my paper at an Irish response uh, in the 1840s and 1850s by the third Earl of Ross, William Parsons, no relation of mine, unfortunately. Um, uh, the, 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 I, I did go and spend some time in the archives in Fir Castle and um, there was some excitement at the idea that somebody called Parsons would be looking at the, um, looking at the papers and I had to sort of sorrily doff my cap and tug my forelock and say, your honor, I'm, I was born on the other side of the bed. Um, so William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross and his friend collaborator uh, over many years, Thomas Romney Robinson. Sorry, my slides are jumping ahead all the time. But also by, this is a picture of Thomas Romney Robinson. Also I want to mention the hidden figure in this photograph who is Mary Ross, um, wife of William Ross, uh, William Parsons who took this photograph of Robinson and who in her work as a blacksmith, as an architect, and as an early experimenter in photography, not to mention her prodigious wealth, enabled a good deal of the astronomical work that I'm about to describe. Robinson was director of the Armagh Observatory and a Church of Ireland minister. He was also incidentally Mariah Edgeworth's brother-in-law, but Mariah Edgeworth uh, had a lot of brothers-in-law, um, uh, and he was a deeply conservative actor in 19th century Ireland. He was firmly opposed to Catholic emancipation of any kind, and later he was almost apoplectic over the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland, not only on political grounds, but also because its disestablishment would remove the principal source of funding for the Armagh Observatory. In 1840, Ross in Burr built a very large telescope in the middle of the country. Um, and anybody who has been there will know that the weather is not exactly conducive to astronomical observation. But he invited Robinson and, and other astronomers to James South to make observations. And what was at stake in building this telescope was nothing less than whether nebulae could be resolved into stars whether a larger telescope than anything the Herschels had built could make anything out of nebulous matter and prove that there was no such thing as nebulosity, nor of stars and planets forming out of nebulous matter. Robinson's interest was to a large degree religious. The science of the formation of the earth was at odds with the truth of religion and its impact on evolutionary theory later in the century confirms of course that, that suspicion. The first observations with the telescope were not promising. Here's Robinson uh, reporting to the Royal Irish Academy. He reports in uh, third person. The great nebula of Orion and that of Andromeda showed no appearance of resolution, but the small nebula near the latter is clearly resolvable. From these and some other discrepancies with John Herschel's observations, Dr. Robinson thinks that of great importance that the globular nebulae and clusters should all be carefully reviewed as it's chiefly from their supposed regularity that the hypothesis of the condensation of nebulous matter into suns and planets has arisen an hypothesis which he thinks has in some instances been carried to an unwarrantable extent. The prose here is rather spare and conceals what we know was the apoplectic depths of Robinson's feelings on this matter. In fact, he had been warned by Ross, uh, warned in writing by Ross not to get carried away in presenting his work to the Royal Irish Academy. Just a couple of paragraphs earlier in the report, we get a sense of the tension between the dry formulaic prose of the scientific report and Robinson's depth of feeling. When in describing uh, what Ross's mechanical prowess has allowed, he writes, it's scarcely possible to preserve the, ne the necessary sobriety of language in speaking of the moon's appearance with this instrument which discovers a multitude of new objects at every point in its, of its surface. We're accustomed to um, what Beckett might call, also using a tele, uh, speaking of a telescope, transports of joy by astronomers uh, translating their work for a non-specialist audience. But when Robinson's attention turns to the nebular hypothesis, there is fury, not joy, buried underneath his words. His, he views the hypothesis of the work of charlatans like John Pringle Nickel and is determined to disprove it at all costs. As Ross's mentor in all things astronomical, Robinson imposes his nebular obsession on Ross 
and sets the course for decades of stellar astronomy in Ireland and elsewhere. It's likely that Robbins's singular obsession and his overbearing influence leads Ross a few years later to build the largest telescope in the world. Um, here's a picture of it from very far away. And um, that's my mother standing in front of it. My mother's about five foot one. So you can uh, figure out how, how large that telescope is. In 1845, Ross finished his monumental telescope, the 72 inch or six foot reflector telescope, having labored long and hard at it. But more about that labor later. Ross was inspired by the 1833 catalog of nebulae published by John Herschel, but he sought to advance the work from cataloging to analysis of their composition, moving in a direction that marked the course of 19th century astronomy from counting to analyzing. The process of making the mirror for the telescope was painstaking and frustrating. It took over 24 hours to melt the metal for the mirror over a peat or a wood or a, a, a turf fire. And then the molten substance was poured into a cast to produce a reflective surface, which takes another several weeks. The first specular mirror was four weeks into the grinding process when it was accidentally broken and the whole task had to begin anew. Any telescope in continuous operation needed two mirrors, one to be used and one to be polished. And Ross, in the end, made five of these mirrors in total. Here again is Robinson. Uh, you'll realize that um, I, I'm almost only quoting Robinson here. Ross himself, um, in many ways, used Robinson as his, as his messenger. But here's Robinson um, uh, and his description of the casting of the speculum mirror. On this occasion, Besides the engrossing importance of the operation, its singular and sublime beauty can never be forgotten by those who are so fortunate as to be present. Above the sky, crowded with stars and illuminated by a most brilliant moon, seem to look down aus auspiciously on their work. Below, the furnaces poured out huge columns of nearly monochromatic yellow flame, and the ignited crucibles uh, during their passage through the air were fountains of red light, producing on the towers of the castle and the foliage of the trees such accidents of color and shade as might almost transport fancy to the planets of a contrasted double star. Nor was the perfect order and arrangement of everything less striking. Each possible contingency had been foreseen, each detail carefully rehearsed, and the workmen executed their orders with a silent and unerring obedience, worthy of the calm and provident self-possession in which they were given. All the work done, he writes later, was, and uh, here's a quote here, Ex executed in Lord Ross's workshops by persons taken from the surrounding peasantry who under his teaching and training have become accomplished workmen, combining with high skill and intelligence, the yet more important uh, requisites of steady habits and good conduct. As the early Ross's, Ross's image of the sort of the good habits, the orderly, but also the fact that this is a series of sort of untrained peasants coming together uh, carries on to um, the great Irish uh, historian of science, Agnes Clerk, writing in 1902. She says, Ross had no skilled workman to assist him. His implements, both animate and inanimate, had to be formed by himself. Peasants taken from the plow were educated by him into efficient mechanics and engineers. And you can see how even, you know, in the, in the very work of describing the, uh, the mechanical work that Ross does, we have the sort of the implication of a, um, of a morality of labor in many ways. While the process is slow and arduous, Ross buries himself in his, de in his detailed descriptions. Uh, Ross buries in his detailed descriptions any consideration of the labor involved. So when Ross writes about his telescope and astronomy, there is practically nothing about the labor involved. From cutting the peat for the fire to handling the mirrors, there had to have been dozens of workers involved in just the casting of the mirror alone. And the carbon cost of running high fires made out of uh, um, turf for hours on end would have been considerable. Indeed, Ross made very, indeed, Ross actually himself made very few observations attributed to the telescope. Much of the work was done by others. And Robert Ball cut his teeth as an assistant in Burr before his appointment at uh, Trinity and Dunsink. The results from the telescope were both extraordinary and disappointing at the same time. This is Romney writing in, uh, Romney Robinson writing in 1848. 
In 1845, Robinson had laid before the Academy the results obtained by James South and himself at the first trials of the magnificent instrument. That's the earlier quote that you saw. The most remarkable of them had reference to what's been called a nebular hypothesis, in which it's supposed that nebulous matter forms sun and planets by its gradual condensation. Above 50 nebulae, selected from Sir John Herschel's catalog, without any limitation of choice but, by their, but their brightness, were all resolved without exception. From this, Robinson conceived himself authorized to ask, is there any evidence that nebulous matter has real existence? Ross even claims this is, a, this is, this is sort of the sort of you know, spectacular um, uh, um, discovery here was that the, the implication that there was no such thing as nebulous matter, that in fact all were already stars and planets preformed. Ross even claimed, wrongly as it turned out, to be able to resolve the great nebula in Orion. And this is a picture um, by Ross um, of the nebula in Orion. If you're interested in how these pictures are formed, there's a great book by Omar Nazim on. Uh, it's called observing by hand about the fact that these were pre-photographic images of, uh, of the stars. It's a really brilliant book, observing by hand. So Ross claimed to be able to resolve the great nebula in Orion, claiming that this was all made up of stars and planets, not, not nebulous gas at all. It was a sensational claim that seemed to offer very strong proof against the nebular theory. It was, of course, wrong. This in 1848, or it was actually in 1845, made that claim, was one of the last great communications from Burr on the question of the resolvability of nebulae. Not only because Ross discovered the spiral shape of some nebulae, what turned out to be actually galaxies, and that wasn't clear for some time. And that changed the nature of the conversation about nebulae, shifting it away from the simple question of resolvability towards an understanding of the dynamic properties of your nebulae. While Robinson and Ross had in one sense to admit defeat when they discovered the spiral form, they'd also made a major breakthrough and one that would be further studied by the second largest telescope of the 19th century, the Great Melbourne Telescope, built in Rath Mines by Grubb and company and shipped out, and, uh, shipped out to Melbourne and, and finally set to work in 1870. This is an image, one of the first photographic images of a nebula. Um, and it is indeed the nebula in Orion taken with the Great Melbourne Telescope. Um, there's a long story to be told about the Great Melbourne Telescope, but it too, it was the second largest telescope in the world in the 19th century. And it was built primarily to study nebulae. But there's another reason why that communication was one of the last communications to come out of Burr in the 1840s. It wasn't just that the spiral form of nebula that had been discovered was <clears throat> a major breakthrough and changed the nature of the conversation. This also happened. This is Robinson. Sorry, I, I have the wrong date on that. It should be 1848. Robinson has often been asked why this instrument in Burr had given no further results. They who put the question had but a faint idea of the overwhelming pressure which the last three years exerted here in Ireland on all who were resolved to discharge the duties which men owe their country. Lord Ross is not a person to seek knowledge or enjoyment in the heavens when he ought to be employed on earth, and he devoted all his energy to relieve the present misery and provide for the future. Ross's record in the famine years was a lot more mixed than Robinson implies. He originally gave generously, but by the end of the famine, he supported a much harsher position, uh, agreeing in almost all respects with Trevelyan. But what I want to give you a sense here, as I'm telling you this story about the work that happened in Burr, and this is obviously a very condensed, to use the, the wrong word, but a very condensed story of, uh, of what happened in Burr. But what I'm trying to give you here is a sense of some of the material and political conditions under which knowledge of the stars and the heavens is invented, made, reproduced, proven, and disproven. While discussions of the nebular hypothesis and Spencer's uptake of and translation of it into a general theory of social and planetary progress tend to be somewhat bloodless and removed from the debates at the time, I think we need to concentrate on the sort of political background and the political um, um, landscape into which this theory is being driven. The debate over the nebular hypothesis, theoretical and speculative as, as speculative as it is, 
has a very specific location, a set of assumptions and conditions that emerge in this place at this time. There is in Robinson and Ross's work, a critique of progress that's both occasioned and enabled by a conservative scientific and political establishment bent on countering the juggernaut of reform in the 19th century by undercutting the imagined universal philosophical basis of the movement. But you're probably wondering by now what all of this has to do with Joyce. I told you I'd be leaning a little bit more on the omni-scientific than on the Joyce side of the equation. I wanna draw your attention to one nebula in particular, and this is the one that I already spoke about. <clears throat> This, or what, what was thought at the time to be a nebula. It's spiral form, now we know it as the Whirlpool Galaxy, it was also known as the Whirlpool Nebula or the Spiral Nebula. Its spiral form was first identified, as I said, in the spring of 1845 by Ross himself at the telescope in Burr. When Ross published the results of his observations, the world was transfixed. Here was, for the first time, an image of what a nebula turns out to have been a galaxy looks like up close. Here was incontrovertible proof that what might appear to the naked eye to be nebulous and ill-formed, a sort of gaseous thing in the sky, had in fact a very definite and what we might call purpose of structure that suggests motion, whether that motion be progressive, regressive, or whatever else. Ross's image was widely reproduced and particularly reproduced in Camille Flammarion's uh, Popular History of Astronomy, a book that was carefully studied by Van Gogh. In attempting to disprove the nebular theory, Ross and Robinson had not only advanced it, but had set in motion the nascent field of galactic science. But of course, as Nico Israel uh, has proven, a spiral is not in any way an innocent shape in the early 20th century. It is, and certainly not in Joyce studies, it is the defining structure of Finnegan's Wake along with so many other artworks of the 20th century. An image of motion and stasis or development and entropy all at once, a perfect index for a balance of progress and regress, course and recourse. We remember that Beckett wrote of Finnegan's Wake that, um, that, it is, that Joyce's writing is not about something, it is that something itself. Or as Nico Israel puts it, the novel is not about a spiral, rather it is a kind of spiral or set of spirals itself. Indeed, as the South African critic Peter D. MacDonald told me when I was talking to him about this paper, Finnegan's Wake is the nebular hypothesis. Israel turns, of course, to Giambattista Vico's new science, which Beckett himself, as we all know, identified as having been adapted by Joyce as a structural convenience or inconvenience. And we heard on Tuesday three really excellent papers from uh, Maria Gurevska, Ariana Mashilka, and Salvatore Papalardo on Vico and Joyce. Papalardo spoke very brilliantly about the figure of the Phoenicians in Vico and Joyce, and I couldn't help but think about the fact that the sea snails that were used to make those blue and purple dyes are, of course, spiral in structure. Once you start seeing spirals, you can't stop seeing them. It all starts to spiral out of control. And we can't think of Joyce and spirals together without calling to mind Konstantin Brancusi's symbol de Joyce, uh, as, uh, and, which is glossed by Brancusi himself as figuring a sort of thrusting or pushing. As Israel argues, however, Joyce is much more attuned to recoiling than to thrusting. A recoiling, he says, that has implications for political readings of his work. And as Beckett wrote, Vico exposes in the new science the ineluctable circular progression of society. This dance of circularity and progression under the night sky is also a structural convenience or inconvenience of the wake. So I'll turn for the last few minutes, I realize I'm just looking at the time here, sorry, I'll, I'll speed it up a little bit. I'll turn for the last few minutes to just a couple of observations from, uh, from the wake. Here we have from um, uh, chapter one, three, it's nebulous an autodidact fact of the commonest that the shape of the average human cloudy fizz, whereas sallow has long days faded, frequently altered in its ego with the possing, or passing, possing of the showers, not original whether it's slopperish matter, given the wet and low visibility, to indentifying the individual one. The clearest gesture towards the nebular hypothesis is this, though this being, of course, Finnegan's Wake, it's a rather nebulous sort of gesture in its own way. 
the suggestion of the possibility that there is an average human of the sort that Spencer might seek in his sociology is undercut by the formlessness of cloudy fizz. The melding of nebulous and nevertheless, along with the appeal to the sim simplicity of an autodidact fact of the commonest, elides the slipperiness or slopperishness of nebulosity, its ungraspability as solid or gas, or as a theory of the formation of stars and planets. But of course, we could think about this through its low visibility as really, like the rest of this section, signaling the Irish climate. Then again, we might remember the link between stormy weather and Vico, bringing us back by a commodious vicus to a circular recirculation, a forward movement that returns us to the present time and location, a progression that corrodes progress. But the nebular theory makes a more marked entrance later, as both Catherine Ebery and John Gordon point out, with the appearance in thinly disguised form of the polymath Henri Poincaré. Thanks ever so much point carried. I can't say if it's the weight you strike me to the quick or that red mass I was looking at, but at the present momentum, potential as I am, I'm seeing rain bogies rings around me. Point carried is of course an echo of Poincaré, whom Gordon calls the latest and last major champion of Laplace's nebular theory in the 19th century, or the 20th century. For John Gordon, at least at times, Finnegan's Wake, like Portrait before it, appears to instantiate a universal protocol of creation and destruction that applies equally to the formation of thoughts and the formation of stars. The nebular hypothesis then is a set of house rules that govern an ambition from early on in Joyce's work to create a book of everything thereby proposing a coherent principle underlying all of his writing, a unified theory of everything. The claim, I think, suggests a Joyce closer to the thrusting or pushing suggested by Brancusi, the singular vision that appears perhaps a little too focused. But Gordon's insistence on a through line from a portrait to the wake in which the nebular hypothesis is bound up with questions of progress and regress is very valuable. I'd only hesitate to associate Joyce with the Spencerian objective of limbing a unified theory of everything, and side instead with those who see in the wake a formal expression of entropy, and one that I want to suggest has a longer history than a focus on the wake and post-Einsteinian physics would allow. For Catherine Ivory, the traces of Poincaré and rainbows point us to the multiple appearances in the novel of spectroscopes, and the way that light can be broken down to open a vista of formerly invisible complexity. Poincaré, I would say, offers a backward and a forward glance all at once to the new physics and the old astronomy. What I'm trying to suggest here today, I'm wrapping up, is that we could also see this as the latest in a long line of Joycean engagements with the nebular hypothesis, that coded as neither unified nor as facing a scientific future, but leave a trail of discarded theories that mark a century long effort to muddle through a strange politics across empire, but with a node in Ireland of anti-progressivism. Not so much a work in progress then as a work of progress, a decades long project with Irish antecedents of constructing a past without forcing a future into existence. Much the same way I think as Colin Tobin was describing on Monday. We can't tell the story of the nebula hypothesis or indeed of arguments over progress in Britain and continental Europe without thinking about the neglect neglected aspect of the location of knowledge and the material history of its coming into being. What Raymond Connell in another sort of discourse writes, uh, speaking of Southern theory or theory from the global South would call the geolocation of knowledge. These questions of scientific knowledge are freighted with urgent political arguments that are given particular focus and meaning at the edge of empire where issues of progress and evolution are inextricable from the administration of power and violence. Not that this is not a true in Britain too, but that these questions are written on the surface in the colonies, that they're shared between Britain, Ireland, South Africa, India, Australia, and more, but given full scope at the edges of the imperial system. So what I want to leave you with today perhaps is nothing more than a series of impressions of a debate over progress expressed in cosmological terms that weaves its way through a portrait Ulysses and Finnegan's wake and that draws on a complex history in Ireland of anti-progressivist thinking that doesn't just emerge at the moment of revivalism nor that is wholly antiquarian nor wholly conservative but that leaves room for a complex contemplation across Joyce's work of the multifaceted politics of progress. If we pay attention to the traces of nebulosity we see the shades 
of an aging debate over the trajectory of our planet. Um, I'll leave it at that. I have lots more to say, um, um, but uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening. And uh, again, thanks to Catherine and Ronan and Laura and John uh, for inviting me. It's been a, it's been a pleasure.